This morning we're starting a new section in the book of 2 Corinthians. We've been going through this book for a little while now. And so the next section is chapters 10 through 13. And I've called this uh, new series, Power in Weakness. Now, once again, I think I need to give you a bit of a background as to the reason why Paul writes what he does in these chapters. There are some people in the church at Corinth who are criticizing Paul for being weak. Look again at what verse 10 says. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. So what they're saying is that Paul looks weak and he sounds weak. And they're thinking, some of them in the church are thinking, isn't Paul supposed to be an apostle of Jesus Christ? Where is the, the evidence of the Holy Spirit's power in his life? So they see him, some in the church see him as weak. And in these, two, uh, these chapters, 10 through 13, Paul uh, defends himself against these attacks. Now, if you've read through these chapters recently, something that might surprise you is that Paul does a lot of boasting. He mentions boasting uh, in the passage that, that Bruce read, the passage we're in this morning. Now, Paul isn't someone who normally boasts. We shouldn't boast. He himself says that. If we're going to boast, we don't boast in ourselves, we boast in the Lord. But he does boast a lot, so what, why, is, why is he doing that? Well, There are some people who have come into the church from the outside, from another place. People Paul calls false apostles in chapter 11, verse 13. He also sarcastically calls them super apostles. These, these, these men are against Paul. Uh, they're they're uh, puffing themselves up and, and criticizing Paul and saying, uh, we're better than Paul, follow us, not Paul. So, really, Paul is forced into boasting. And really, the boasting is not a sinful boasting. It's really giving his qualifications to them as a, a true apostle of Jesus Christ. So, really, I think what he's saying is, I have to talk like a fool. He mentions that a, a new, uh, number of times, uh, talking like a fool throughout these chapters. He's saying, I have to talk like a fool in order to discredit the fools among you. He has to talk their language. And so that's why, why Paul is, is boasting throughout. He's giving his qualifications as a true apostle. Now, surprisingly, uh, one of the things that, that Paul boasts about in these chapters is his weakness. People were critical of his apparent weakness, but Paul actually boasts in his weakness. Uh, chapter 11, verse 30, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Also over in, in chapter 12, I will boast all the more gladly, verse 9, boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And the next verse, when, when I am weak, then I am strong. So Paul understood that, that God isn't limited by our weakness. He's not limited by our weakness. Actually, our, our weakness, if we acknowledge our weakness, that can be a good thing. You know, sometimes it's a bad thing to be overconfident. That might happen around the house project that needs to be done. I could be confident in, in uh, rewiring my house, but if I tried to do that on my own, it would be 
a disaster. I have to come to the realization that I don't have that skill, that expertise. I need to call someone who does an electrician. And so when I recognize my weakness in that area, that's a good thing because I can get the help, the right kind of help that I need. And so it's sort of the same with, with God and, and our weakness. Really, when we understand, like Paul did, that, that we're weak, that we're not relying on ourselves, our own strength and so on, our weakness can drive us to rely on God's power, not our own. And so there is power in weakness. Uh, chapter 12 is the, is the place where he really says that most clearly, but throughout this section, the third and final section of 2 Corinthians, he talks about his weakness and how really his weakness was not something that lowered him as an apostle, but allowed him more to embody Jesus Christ himself. Now, in reading, when you read 1 Corinthians and, and 2 Corinthians, one of the things you discover is that the church at Corinth wasn't a perfect church. It was far from it. The church had, had lots of problems. And in 2 Corinthians, we've seen some of those problems already. There was not unity among all, all the people in the church. Uh, in chapter 7, he ends that section on a high note, uh, thanking them for, the majority of them, for, for turning from, from their sin and uh, their lack of support to Paul when he visited them prior to this. And what that tells us is that the majority of the church supported Paul, but there was a rebellious minority. And there were also these, these teachers who had come in who were turning the people, some of them, against Paul. And so there was that lack of unity. Uh, there were false teachers. Paul will talk about this later on in this section. There was sin in the church. And so it wasn't a perfect church. Sometimes we can read these epistles, some of them, and think these churches were, were perfect churches, but they weren't. It's certainly clear that the church at Corinth was not a perfect church. That's true of every church. No church is perfect because every church is made up of imperfect people, like you and me. And sadly, in every church, there will be some amount of conflict. And if you're in a position of leadership, and I'm not just thinking of a position like an elder, though that would be included, but any position where you have some amount of responsibility, you'll soon discover that not everyone is your biggest fan. Sometimes people can be unfairly critical. Sometimes people can be critical for good reasons as well, and sometimes it's a mix of fair and not fair. And that's what Paul is experiencing as he writes 2 Corinthians. People are unfairly criticizing him, and some of them are against Paul. So what should we do when, when people are against us? What should we do when we're unfairly criticized if we're in some position of responsibility in the church? I want us to especially think of this question in the context of a church. This is what the situation was with, with Paul and the church at Corinth, though we can apply it to, uh, to uh, dealing with conflict outside of the church as well. Now, of course, Paul was an apostle, so how he dealt with conflict isn't quite the same as how we should deal with conflict. He was an apostle, so he had much more authority than, than you and I do. However, I believe that uh, this passage does give us uh, a few ways 
in which we should deal with people who are against us. So first, when people are against us, be meek and gentle like Christ. Look at verse 1. I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away. So obviously, that second part, he's using their characterization or some of the people's characterization of Paul. That he was bold, he was strong when, when he was far away writing letters, but when he came to visit them, he was, he was weak or, or timid. That was how some of them saw Paul. So he was, he was accused of being inconsistent. Now, probably because of this, instead of starting off this section in a bold way, he writes, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So he could have started off by saying, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, demand you to do this. But that's not the approach uh, he took. He says, I entreat you. That means I really, I, I plead with you. I, I even beg of you. How? By the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So what he's doing is he's giving the rebellious minority one last chance to repent. You know that God is, is slow to anger. He's, he's patient. He desires to show mercy, not judgment. And so Paul is, is acting like that here as an apostle. He's offering them mercy, the rebellious minority, instead of bringing judgment. That really is the, the heart of God. I thought of, of John chapter 3, verse 17, which says, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn or judge the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. And then also, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. He's, he's, he's talking about those who would, would scoff at the promise of the return of Jesus. Uh, he says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come or reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. It will come one day like a thief, uh, unexpectedly to many. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And so, this approach is in line, Paul's approach here, pleading with them by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, it's in line with, with the heart of God, the character of Christ. Uh, quoting uh, D.A. Carson, who's, who's written a book on this section of 2 Corinthians called A Model of Christian Maturity, he writes, meekness and gentleness taken together suggests that the person characterized by such virtues will be generous in his estimate of others, slow to take offense, well able to bear reproach, consistently above mere self-interest. However, there were some in Corinth who saw Paul's humility as, as weakness. But really... It takes great strength to be meek and gentle. It would have been easier for Paul just to come out and use his authority as an apostle. But instead, he did something more difficult. He pleaded with them by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. That really takes more strength. 
it, it takes more strength to be when someone uh, maybe uh, we're unsure if, if what they said uh, we should take offense at. Well, it's harder to be generous in our estimates of others. It's, it's harder to be slow to take offense. It's, it's hard to be well able to bear reproach. It's, it's very difficult to consistently be above mere self-interest, to use those words that, that Carson does. This is, not, this is not weakness on the part of Paul, but great strength. Meekness and gentleness don't come naturally. They don't come easily. Uh, what's, what's the normal reaction when, when we're being attacked, when people are against us, or when people criticize us unfairly? What's, what's the normal reaction? The normal reaction is to, to return fire, to attack back. Maybe directly or indirectly, maybe indirectly by talking about that person, complaining about that person to someone else, and maybe they will have a lower view of that person than they did before. And, and uh, that's the normal response. This kind of meekness and gentleness that, that, that Paul has really only comes from the Holy Spirit. Remember what the, the fruit of the Spirit is in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit, really what the, fruit, uh, what the Spirit produces in our lives, it's love, joy, peace. Peace was lacking in Corinth. Patience, Paul was seeking to uh, have patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And the two, are, two last ones are very applicable to Paul's situation, and often our own situations, gentleness and self-control. These are the fruit of the Spirit. Something that these things don't come naturally to us, but we can receive them from the Spirit. And so what we should do first is be meek and gentle, like Christ. That's not weakness, but actually great strength. Secondly, when people are against us, let the gospel do its work. Let's look again at verses 2 through 6 of chapter 10. I beg of you, is the word beg, that when I am present... I may not have to show boldness, he's talking about judgment here as an apostle, with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. He might be thinking here about the false teachers with the word some. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Verse 6 might seem a bit confusing. He's not saying when you start to obey, then we'll come and we'll punish your disobedience. Uh, what he's talking about is, is uh, the whole church minus the false teachers who come into the church. When, when the whole original church uh, is unified and, and they've turned from uh, their wrong thinking, then Paul will come and he'll take care of, of the, the false apostles. Now, it was because of Paul's apparent weakness that he was seen by some to be walking according to the flesh. The flesh, uh, he uses it in two ways. Uh, the next way he talks about just living uh, as a man, a human, in a physical body. But the first time he talks about walking according or living according to the flesh, uh, he's talking about the fallen nature, our sinfulness, when he uses that word flesh. 
really what he's being accused of is, again, lacking the Holy Spirit's power. But in verse 4, Paul says, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now, what were these weapons? They weren't actual weapons, and he wasn't going up against people who had actual weapons, but these weapons were of a spiritual nature. Uh, The weapons of his opponents, the false apostles, would have been things like fancy speech and uh, charisma and things like that, uh, that Paul avoided. I believe that Paul's greatest weapon is the gospel. Uh, the gospel is like a battery, battering ram that knocks down strongholds. Paul doesn't depend on things like human ingenuity, showmanship, personal charisma. He simply preaches the gospel and lives out the gospel. There is power in the gospel. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, the gospel is the power of of God. And I believe another weapon would have been prayer. These spiritual weapons. And when he talks about destroying arguments in verse 5, he's not talking about out debating people. Uh, I'm sure Paul was a capable debater, but he didn't try to convince people solely by debating them. He depended on the gospel, prayer, and the Holy Spirit. He's talking about these spiritual weapons that are able to change people's hearts. He was unable to do that on his own. But there is power in our weakness when we realize that we can't do it ourselves. Then that's when God works best through us. Now, as I said, we could think of this as well with uh, conflict that might arise or situations that might arise with with people who are outside the church. And and we might even think about someone who is against Christianity. We know that for many, Christianity is not popular. Uh, Some people see it as the cause of of all of the world's problems. Uh, People sincerely believe that. Not the church... The church as an organized thing uh, hasn't caused its share of problems. But uh, I believe that those who are sincere followers of Christ will show love and do good and not evil. And uh, a lot of people who profess to be Christians or profess to be church leaders don't uh, exemplify the kinds of things that Paul is talking about, such as the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Uh, so there are people who would be against Christianity. How, how, do we, how do we convince them? Do we just, do we just out-debate them so that they can't uh, believe anything else but what we believe? I think that that is extremely rare. I don't think many people are ever uh, debated into the kingdom of God. Again, let me quote D.A. Carson, what he says about this. Argue a skeptic into a corner, and you will not take his mind captive for Christ. But pray for him, proclaim the gospel to him, live out the gospel of peace, walk righteously by faith until he senses your ultimate allegiance and citizenship are vastly different from his own, and you may discover that the power of truth, the convincing and regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and the glories of Christ, Jesus, shatter his reasons and demolish his arguments until you take captive his mind and heart to make them obedient to Christ. The result will be a transformed life. And so Paul's not talking about, as a master debater, being able to convince people. He's talking about proclaiming the gospel, living out the gospel, and letting the gospel do its work and and change people's hearts and minds. Uh, there was a time when, when I uh, spent a lot more time on Twitter than I do today, and one of the things I would do is I'd try to debate people, and, and, and most of the time it, it didn't really turn out well, because especially 
in that forum, it's very hard to convince someone who is a stranger and you're a stranger of uh, what you believe. And so I began to take a different approach and I would continue, I don't do this anymore, but uh, I, would I, would, I would talk to people and I started to have a circle of friends where we did this, just talk to people and, and try to give solid answers and reasons, but try to do it in a way that would leave a good impression on them as to, to what a Christian is supposed to be. Uh, so at least maybe lead them maybe a little bit of the way toward seeing that Christianity uh, isn't all bad. Now, I remember, uh, well, there's one video game I play, and I'm on a, a Discord server. A few of you might know what that is, but uh, I was talking to the guy, and, and he knew that I was a pastor, and, and, and so I try, to be, uh, I try to be a good sport and all of that. Uh, but I looked up the comment. I remembered what he said uh, vaguely, but he to quote what he said, he said, someday maybe you could talk this agnostic off of the fence. And he was very interested in, in what church I belong to and all of that. So, you know, we might not be able to debate someone into the kingdom of God, but we can conduct ourselves in such a way, also giving solid answers, uh, sharing the gospel and so forth, but also doing it in the right way. And so, and so Paul, in the church, it should be different in the church where, where we say that we believe the gospel. When the gospel is put before us, how we're to, how we're to live with meekness and gentleness and so on, uh, then when a Christian is against us or when we're against them, maybe unfairly, that the gospel should be able to do a work in our heart. I read something, a good statement this morning, which was the gospel is the engine of the Christian life, not just the key. Thinking of a car. In other words, the gospel is, is needed, needed for more than just, just starting the Christian life, just like you use the key to, to start the engine. Really, we need the gospel from the start to the end of our Christian life. The gospel, not just the key, but, but the engine. It's what keeps us going. And I believe that when the gospel is at the forefront of our minds, then we will live differently. We'll have that meekness and gentleness that Paul had. We'll, we'll be more like Christ. And so, especially within the church, the gospel needs to be proclaimed and we need to pray that the gospel would do its work. I should point out that Paul does have here the threat of church discipline. And so that's always the last, last resort. But there's a third thing we should do before that. Seek to build up, not destroy. Finally, let's look at the last few verses, 7 through 11. Look at what is before our eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind him himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightened, frightening you with my letters, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. So, just take note of what Paul says about wanting to build up, not destroy. One of the metaphors of the church is a building. The church is a, like a building. Uh, Paul wants to build up. He wants to strengthen the church at Corinth. He doesn't want to destroy it. He doesn't want to tear it down. He doesn't want to judge part of that church. And really, that's how Paul ends this section as well in chapter 13, verse 10. For this reason, I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. So again, one of the natural, normal responses is when we're offended, when people are against us, when we're criticized, uh, we want to tear the person down uh, instead of building them up. But Paul 
took that Christ-like approach of wanting to, to build up the church, the whole church, not just those who were for him, but those who were for and against him. Now, there was more at stake in Corinth than just people having the right opinion of, of Paul. It wasn't just about his popularity. People should like me. I, I'm a good apostle. Uh, I've done some good work in Corinth. It wasn't merely that. It really was that in the church, the gospel was at stake. They had apparently forgotten that Christ had been crucified in weakness. That's what he says in chapter 13, verse 4. Christ was crucified in weakness. He came, he humbled himself. Generally, he lived by meekness and gentleness, though he did at times speak some, some harsh truth to those who were hypocrites. But really, they had become, begun to drift away from the gospel, listening to false apostles. And so the gospel was at stake. Now, what's at stake when there's church conflict? One of the things that is at stake is our witness. Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So there's more at stake than just whether or not people treat me the right way. What is at stake is our witness. And if we truly believe the gospel that we've accepted, it's not just for the start of the Christian life, it's for the whole Christian life. And that should lead us to live in a different way. And so there's more at stake than just people liking me or people treating me well or fairly. It's more than that. It goes deeper than that. Our witness uh, as a church and as Christians is at stake. And so that's the reason why, why Paul spends so much time on this. It wasn't merely about him, it was about them. If they turned away from the gospel, then really there would be no more church at Corinth. And with us, there's lots at stake. And at the top would be our witness as followers of Jesus Christ. And so we need to have that meekness and gentleness that Christ had. We need to let the gospel do its work in the hearts of others, but also in our own hearts. And we need to seek to build up one another, not destroy, even those who might seem to be against us.